Hi, this is David Heine of Aspect Art. Today we're in The Hague at the Maris House for what is probably the blockbuster show of the year, Rembrandt's Self. This is a remarkable journey through Rembrandt's life as told through his self-portraits. Here at the Maris House they've managed to bring together from all over the world 65 etchings, drawings and paintings. Today we're going to be talking with Quentin Buffalo, who is the curator of this show, who's going to tell us some very interesting things about these portraits. So I hope you enjoy this. Please join us now for Rembrandt's Self. Quinta, could you tell me, first off, um, how is it that uh, this show came about? Well, the idea for this exhibition was uh, proposed by our director three years ago when we uh, were working, uh, well, we were having the Vermeer exhibition in the Mauritz House, and it was a major success. And uh, with the National Gallery in London, and in London there are two self-portraits by Rembrandt, two very famous self-portraits, uh, we came up with the idea to have this exhibition, which is sort of like a dream of any museum director. Now, how many uh, self-portraits, etchings and drawings have you uh, brought together here? Well, in the exhibition we have 65 self-portraits, uh, more than 30 etchings, uh, seven drawings and 28 paintings and you must know that uh, it's very difficult to obtain well I was just talking about a dream and in a dream you would have every self-portrait but not every self-portrait is allowed to travel because it's painted on panel and very fragile when you would remove it from a gallery to another gallery um, and another thing is that a very famous painting, for instance, is in the Frick collection, and those paintings are not allowed to be lent to other museums, um, and so on and so on. The 17th century was a time of uh, great change in Holland and other places. Is this reflected in Rembrandt's paintings and self-portraits? Well. It's very difficult because these changes are in general and with Rembrandt you see Rembrandt in particular, you see one person, one very famous artist, but I think in a painting from the 1630s, at least two paintings from the 1630s, you see Rembrandt as a very well, wealthy a bourgeois person, a burger we call that in Holland, and you really see someone developing as an artist but also dressed as people from his time, because in other self-portraits you see him in 16th century costume, so you don't really see a 17th century person at all, but uh, someone dressing up as a very famous artist, as Rembrandt did in his self-portraits. But you see uh, why Rembrandt was able to make so many self-portraits, because there was a market for these self-portraits, and uh, because with his uh, clients buying these paintings, he was able to make so many uh, works of art. Now, uh, speaking of that, uh, could you tell me why did Rembrandt dress up like he did in so many costumes? Well, the thing is we cannot ask Rembrandt because Rembrandt died a long time ago and there are not, uh, we don't have a document stating why he made self-portraits, but we know of the history of making self-portraits and the beginning of Rembrandt as a painter of self-portraits is in a history painting, so you have a story, we don't know what story is depicted, it's a painting from Leiden, the city where Rembrandt uh, was born and worked, um, and then you see all kinds of figures and then just a small head, and then you see Rembrandt appear in this uh, narrative scene. And then uh, you also have pictures from the beginning of his career where you see him experimenting with light and shadow. So that's one thing. But then later on you see, for instance, I was just talking about paintings from the 1630s, he also made self-portrait as a sort of model for clients. So apparently to show his uh, clients, well, this is what I can make, this is what I can portray you like I have portrayed myself. And then uh, with time going on, you see his style developing. And uh, we know, because we don't think uh, that all these self-portraits were meant as a painted autobiography, but just uh, made for the market. But you see him uh, sort of experimenting with styles. And we know that uh, these self-portraits were very popular because it was sort of like you buy two things in one because you not only have a 
self-portrait of a very famous artist, but also a painting by this very famous artist with all these different styles. So you have two in one. Now you've hung the uh, exhibition here in a chronological order, and uh, the, the old history of Rembrandt uh, seemed to say, well, he was a rebel when he was young, and this is borne out by his, uh, his etchings in Leiden. And later, then, he became kind of resigned from all the tragedy in his life. Is this a way that we should view Rembrandt? Well, everybody has his right to view Rembrandt the way he or she wants, but uh, when I think of the word rebel, I, f I think I'd rather think of James Dean than Rembrandt, because I think Rembrandt is just uh, a big artist living in Holland in the 17th century, and uh, the word rebel is, is not appropriate for an artist like him, but uh, it's very difficult with Rembrandt, because he is so famous and labeled as rebel and as many other things, uh, and I think people should just come and see the exhibition and meet the true Rembrandt, Rembrandt as seen by himself, and so they can judge for themselves. Now, Rembrandt is almost unmatched in uh, self-portraiture. Why is this, and why are they so enduring? Again, it's very difficult to give one answer to that question, but uh, I think that Rembrandt is, 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 is one of the greatest artists, not only of the Netherlands, but I think uh, all over the world, from history at least. And uh, what I think is, with every great work of art, that everybody has a different story relating to this painting or etching or drawing, whatever you see from Rembrandt. Um, and I think that's the only thing I can say. With, with great works of art, you see uh, a great deal of expression. And with all this expression, you can relate to that with your own life and with your own story. Now we see Rembrandt aging, and we note, uh, in, if we look in the chronological order, that by the late 40s he showed a more resigned kind of, less proud kind of thing. Is this due to the tragedies in his life, or uh, what was going on there? Well, again, you, you, you can relate it to his own biography, but we, we tend to think in the Maurits House that all these self-portraits are not a painted autobiography, but just paintings made for the market or paintings to experiment with light and shadow and not uh, as a reflection of his own life. So you can, of course, look at the date on a painting or an etching or drawing and say, well, this is the year, for instance, uh, when Saskia died or uh, when you have a late self-portrait. We have three self-portraits in the last room of the exhibition paintings uh, that were never seen in one room before and then of course you can say well he looks very tired he looks very old you can see he survived two wives and his only surviving son but still I tend to think otherwise about his paintings when we look at at some of the Rembrandt paintings we see him portraying himself even in the late times as a clown almost. Uh, one of the last paintings in that room you were talking about is Rembrandt again as a clown. Did he always have a sense of humor in his paintings? Well, not always, and, and clown, I don't think I would want to use that word for Rembrandt, but you can relate to Rembrandt as a sort of clown when you have etchings from 1630 where he really uh, makes uh, strange faces to experiment with, well, to, to, to know how he depicts someone laughing or crying or looking angry. But, uh, no, I think he liked to dress up, but that's another thing because you can, of course, dress up as a clown. I don't know if they really had clowns like we know them nowadays, but... Um, no, I think he like, liked to dress up because in most of the self-portraits, the costume is not contemporary, but 16th century. So all the berets you see Rembrandt wearing, he was introducing them in self-portraits, are actually 16th century and based on, I think, etchings or at least engravings and uh, most of the time portraits of 16th century Dutch or Flemish artists. Uh, but no, I, I think we would just... Uh, think of Rembrandt who liked to dress up. I think you should, but and then not actually, but only in his mind, because we don't know he really owned uh, 16th century garments, but we know, for instance, on this painting we're now standing uh, before, that uh, the white man's cap he's wearing is actually is described in his inventory, so we know he had white caps like this. Recently we did a, a program in the Rembrandt house uh, of the Kunstkammer of Rembrandt, uh, in the old days, uh, they used to believe he was such an eccentric because he collected all these things, but you see them in some of these, uh, and his costumes also, don't you? 
Uh, this painting that we're standing in front of right now is very loosely sketched in the bottom. Is this a, a typical style of Rembrandt? Well, it is, because some people tend to think it's an unfinished picture, but it's typical for Rembrandt to, 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 to conceive his paintings as finished when he thought it was finished. So for us, it may appear unfinished, but uh, it's typical for late artists or artists in the last decade of their lives to 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 sort of leave out the details and it's also for composers or, or poets you see that their work in their last decade is different and the same goes for Rembrandt I think for any great artist and this painting in particular is very important because you see the painter at work but also when you see x-rays of the painting you see that he actually changed the composition because every self-portrait was made in front of a mirror and when you paint in front of a mirror or you, you copy in paint uh, your, uh, your image in the mirror, then the left hand becomes a right hand and the right hand becomes a left hand. And this problem is something Rembrandt had to overcome all in his life when he made self-portraits. And then in this painting you see now um, the brushes in the, well for the viewer it's the right hand, but actually they were in the first phase of the painting in the other hand, but then that was not uh, consistent with reality because Rembrandt was right-handed. So uh, for him, he had to hold a brush in a self-portrait, again, in his right hand. And that's at the left for the viewer. But uh, now we only see a blur uh, because he didn't really work out this detail of the hand. But uh, it's very um, uh, important to see that these paintings were indeed made in front of a mirror. Now, Rembrandt was a great admirer of Rubens. Uh, Rubens was a, a courtly painter, a man who specialized in great, uh, what we would say maybe mythological or courtly type things. Rembrandt was more living in Burgerville, or where there were not a great aristocracy or huge courts that he could. Uh, was he frustrated in the sense of, of just having still lives? And uh, He was a history painter originally, wasn't he? Uh, I don't think Rembrandt was frustrated at all. I think that's a misconception, but uh, what we shouldn't forget, and you were just mentioning that, that Rembrandt first and foremost saw himself as a painter of history uh, paintings, and then, I mean, uh, with scenes from the Bible or uh, allegories or whatever, but not as a portrait painter, and still lives from Rembrandt are not really known, but only as part of genre paintings. Um, and I don't think he was frustrated at all, because he was a very successful artist, but only in the last two decades decades of his life. Uh, well, he kept on working, but uh, his style sort of went uh, out of fashion, and that's something Rubens, who died very young, younger than Rembrandt, uh, never experienced, but it could have happened to Rubens as well. And you're right in saying that Rubens and Rembrandt are different figures, but in their own right, because Rubens was a very international artist uh, who traveled, well, at least in Europe, and Rembrandt didn't do that, but, uh, and we don't know why he didn't. Now, Rembrandt went bankrupt in the 50s. Did this have a, a major effect on his self-portraits that is discernible in this show? Again, no, it's very difficult to see that because it, it looks like uh, Rembrandt kept on making self-portraits whatever happened in his life. And still you can, of course, conclude, well, this painting, perhaps this is made from, because we are in this room, we have paintings from, from 1659, but I cannot see any detail of his life in this painting, so I don't think it's reflected, and you don't see that he uses cheaper canvases or cheaper uh, materials, so my answer is no, you cannot relate all these facts to the paintings in the exhibition or the works of art. Well, we know Rembrandt uh, portrayed himself as a, as a disciple of Jesus in one of them. Was he a religious man, and is this also discernible in any? Well, he must have been, because he made a lot of uh, history painting with scenes from the Bible, and sometimes because he also made a self-portrait as the Apostle St. Paul, who sort of, uh, well, spread the faith. And you can also relate to saying, well, Rembrandt also, in his own way, spread, uh, well, the Christian faith, via his paintings because he made so many paintings with Christian themes, but uh, that's an explanation we make now in the 20th century, and uh, again, we don't have documents and we cannot ask Rembrandt anymore. 
Now, some people have said that actually Rembrandt was more like Durer in the sense of trying to elevate the status of the individual artist. Uh, of course, the 17th century was a time of individualism. Do you see a relationship there? Oh, well, I see another relationship because Durer was, uh, at least in Rembrandt's time, uh, cherished not only for his paintings but also for his engravings. And Rembrandt not only collected these engravings but saw himself also as a well, not only a painter, but also as an etcher. So you have sort of like a fame based on two aspects of your artisanship, etchings and paintings. And that's the same thing that goes for Durer. But um, for the other aspects, again, I must say uh, we don't know. Now, many of Rembrandt's uh, pupils went on to be somewhat successful painters. Did any of them really adopt his style? Oh, definitely. Um, well, also in compositions we see uh, that they derive from Rembrandt, and you see in this exhibition, for instance, self-portraits that are very close to Rembrandt's self-portrait of 1640 in the National Gallery in London, so that's one thing. And we even know of one pupil, Arend de Gelder, who all his life, and he also lived in the beginning of the 18th century, worked in Rembrandt's late style when that was totally out of fashion. So indeed, Rembrandt's style was given through via his pupils, and then after Arend de Gelder died in 1727, then Rembrandt's style was definitely, well, uh, history. Now, could you tell me a little about uh, the exhibition times... What, uh, are there still tickets available for this show? Yes, there are still tickets available, and the Maurits has open seven days a week. And we also have, because these tickets uh, are sold in advance sale, and people can check in their countries uh, how to obtain them, uh, but also people can uh, risk and come to the Maurits house and try to obtain a day ticket, which they can buy on the day itself. How long will the show be running? Uh, through uh, the 9th of January, 2000. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to talk with us today. Well, you're welcome.